Hi everyone, Kayla here. I just wanted to give a quick trigger warning. In this episode, we do discuss suicide. If this makes you uncomfortable in any way, please feel free to skip this episode. Our feelings will not be hurt. Um, other than that, feel free to continue on to the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we stumble into an elevator, moving down, 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 until we finally reach the basement, and then, BAM! Motherfucking ghost! <laughs> I am your host, Kayla King. <laughs> I am joined by my other two wonderful co-hosts, Sade. Hello, I am here, eating rice balls. I am jealous of you. So jealous of you. And my other co-host, David King. It's totally natural phenomena, it's just weasel wind. <laughs> Uh, um, so, uh, we actually read, uh, I mean, the best way to describe it, it's, it's J-horror. It's basically <laughs> the definition of J-horror. Uh, we just finished reading The Graveyard Apartment, um, by Mariko, uh, Koike, or Koike. Thank you. Okay. Koike. I s spent a lot of time going through YouTube listening to this last name to make sure I can pronounce it correctly. Koike. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, this is definitely a J-horror book. Uh, in terms of when the book came out, though, it's hard to say because, uh, there's a lot of publications that, that say 1986, but then when you look it up, it says 1993, like the actual book in Japan came mm -hmm. out. Uh, it's, it's clearly a very old book, so... Isn't it weird to think of, like, books from the 90s as very old books now? Though? I know. That's the that, that makes me feel old. That explains why, like, when I was reading, I was like, why ain't nobody calling for help on their cell phone? I was like, oh, that explains it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's that old. Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. And it does date it as uh, 1986. At least the story itself does take place in 1986. So. Oh, you're right. I must not have been paying that much attention. It, <laughs> it's okay. They don't ever say that it's... The 80s, the only hint that we get that it's the 80s is the fact that, like, one of the characters is wearing a, a cardigan with shoulder pads. And that's the point where I'm like, wow, that's the <laughs> most 80s thing I have heard in this whole book. Doesn't it, doesn't it also, like, give the date at the start of each chapter? <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing. Like, if you didn't pay attention to the beginning of each chapter, like, that's what I'm saying. In the story itself, that's the only thing that I can think of that's actually... I would look at the month and I kept skipping over the year. Oh, know? yeah. Well, it, it stays... It's only for set over the course of a few months in 1987, so... 87, sorry, not 86. My apologies. Wow. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, Say, do you want to give the summary? Yes, I will. <laughs> do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so the graveyard apartment follows the uh, poor situation that the Kano family have found themselves in. We have Misao, the wife, Tepe, the husband, their daughter, Tamao, and I don't think they specified her age, but she is starting kindergarten in the story, so I'm going to guess about five. And their doggy, they have a doggo named Cookie. Spelt cookie might be pronounced cookie, but cookie, we're going to call <laughs> precious pup of cookie because it is cute. And they also move in to their new apartment with this cute little white finch named uh, Pyoko. And so this family has just moved in to this high rise apartment called Central Plaza Mansion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Central Plaza Mansion. Yes. It is, for the most part, seems quite ideal. It is, it's, it's sunny, it's spacious, plenty of room. For the kid to grow, there's room for the dog. It's a nice area to walk your dog. It's a nice sh few minutes away from Taikano Station, which uh, Tepe uses to get to work. It is a short walk from Tamao's new elementary or kindergarten where she's starting. And Misao also ends up pretty buddy buddy with uh, one of the neighbors on the fourth floor. They're on the eighth floor, and uh, she kind of makes friends with Eiko, who is 
another mother on the fourth floor and she has a daughter named Kaori and a son named Sutomu and then like I forget the husband's name because we only like met him way later but it seems quite ideal except for the fact that it's surrounded by a graveyard on three sides um and it's quite visible from their balcony and you've got graveyard and forest and you can see the temple and the crematorium where there's often a plume of black smoke Hmm, I personally would kind of dig it, but for Misao, it's kind of like really a buzzkill, but the affordability and the location and just everything else was so ideal, and they kind of had to scrap their money together to afford it. It was just like right in their budget, so you make do with what you got, and at first, everything is wonderful, except Pyoko, the little bird, died the night they moved in, and it's kind of creepy. Because Tamawa's like, he still comes see me at night and tells me things because he talks. He's a dead bird and he talks. And Masao's not too happy about that. <laughs> Tepe kind of brushes that off. Um, but for the most part, everything's kind of normal and Misao settles in. And we meet some of the other characters like Tepe's brother, younger brother, Tatsuji, and his wife, Naomi. And we also learn that Tepe was previously married to a woman named Reiko and... She hung herself in their entry hallway while Tepe was away doing affair stuff with Misao. Yeah. Damn. And, but you know what? They moved on for that and Tepe and Misao got together, it had Tamao, and now they're here. And unfortunately, other strange things start to happen. They notice like a weird black shadow on the TV set. Um, there's this oddly cold chill in the basement where they have storage units for that, for all the apartments to use. But then, uh, Tamao has an accident where she, her knee is cut open and the only way they can kind of explain it is this thing called a weasel wind, which I had not heard of before until this. But if there's no, like, outdoor access from the basement, there's no real way wind could have gotten in, so it's all very, like, hmm. And then some of the tenants all start moving out and experiencing weird things. Oh, and when Tamau got hurt, the elevator, which is the only access point to the basement, stopped working. And so they couldn't get to the kids uh, for a while until Mr. Shoji, who is a yoga instructor, we later learn, uh, does some chanting and then seems to, like, clear the bad energy and gets the elevator to move uh, but then there's other weird little things that I think I am forgetting what else creepy stuff happened uh, there's more TV static the dog going crazy um, oh and then so the tenants will start moving out uh, until it is just the like Mr. Shoji who was living there moves out as other the sisters and this uh, company that was selling weight gain bars moved out. There are the Tabatas, who uh, are the caretakers, kind of like the ma the live-in managers. They're also, they were also there to like experience some of the things, and at one point they asked Tepe uh, to go investigate the basement with them. At this point, everyone has stopped using the basement because it's like too creepy down there. But uh, the two managers, uh, Sueo and Mitsue, just are like, we heard noises. It sounded like something was being thrown around down there. Can you come investigate with us? Because we're old. So the two uh, <laughs> managers and Tepe head down to the basement <laughs> um, to uh, look around, and they don't find anything. And Tepe's have already investigated, like looked around once, trying to figure out where Tamao had hurt her knee. And they're about to leave when there's suddenly just there's this cold wind that picks up and the elevator won't open and they uh, Tepe blacks out and Mitsue pisses herself, the poor woman. And just overall, finally Tepe at that point, he had been like stubborn and refusing to accept that like weird shit was going on. At that point, he's like, OK, I cave. That's weird shit going on. So the Tabatas move out, too. And so does Eiko and her family. Uh, and so the Kano family are the only ones left, and they are trying to find a place to, to move out to. Uh, it's going to hurt them financially to sell this apartment that they just bought, but they have to get away from this building. And the first, they find this small little house, and it's like, it's small, but it's the it's, it's actually kind of ideal for just what they can afford. But mysteriously, uh, the night they signed the, tempor the temporary contract, because uh, they were going to go back the next day to find the, sign the official contract, the house burns down. 
to ashes overnight and it's like oh no maybe it's just a terrible coincidence and so they then instead uh agree to move into an apartment uh where this young woman who is newly engaged is going to be vacating uh, and she dies mysteriously in the apartment soon immediately after and so they can't move into the apartment because one they have to investigate her weird death uh, and two, they don't want to move into an apartment where someone just died when they're trying to get away from an apartment full of graveyard. But, uh, so, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> uh, then we learned that uh, through some stroke of luck, they Tepe has a co-worker who's moving to New York, and they can, like, sublease his house while he's away for, like, a few years. So, great, ideal. And then things finally start to get crazy. Uh, Tatsuji, Tepe's brother, and his, and Tatsuji's, Tatsuji's wife Naomi stay the night to help them move the next morning but the next morning they discover they can't open windows they can't open the balcony door they go downstairs to the entrance and it has been covered in gunky white handprints and they can't open the door and when the movers in the truck show up they get incinerated and turn into like goop (laughs) she looks crazy and the family is stuck there in this apartment. They can't get out. And uh, anytime somebody shows up, they get incinerated to group. So poor phone guy and poor <laughs> air conditioner guy. Never forget. Uh, but then when they are running out of food, they remember the high calorie protein weight gain bars that were left behind in the basement. And so Tatsuji and Tepe head down there to get them, but then they notice a little chink in the wall, in the back wall of the basement, and Tatsuji takes a hammer and starts banging open a, a, a bigger hole, and they realize that they're... I just completely glossed over the underground road, didn't I? There's an underground road attached to that wall that Masao had earlier investigated at the Ward Library that it was a construction project that had almost happened where the Ward wanted to build an underground shopping arcade that led from where that apartment building is from Taikaino Station because they wanted to add a whole bunch of apartments there and just kind of add to the populace and just like really bring up the area. Gotta gentrify everything. Yeah! The Manseji Temple and the crematorium and the graveyard were, uh, no, we can't do that because then we'd have to move the graveyard and we can't move the graveyard because this place is so old that we buried bodies here back before um, cremating was became popular. But the city went ahead and like dug the tunnel. From my understanding, through under under the graveyard Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was speculation up until this point whether they had filled it in or not and so when Tatsuji breaks through that wall and opens up a hole and they see the road the underground tunnel road they're like oh shit maybe they never filled it in but like Tatsuji's like this is our way out so Tatsuji and Naomi go in and we hear them screaming and then they don't come back and so the rest of the family misao tepe and tamao and cookie have to bunker down and are surviving off of protein bars until something chilling comes up the uh, elevator the end (laughs) great so that was a good discussion (laughs) yeah wow (laughs) what'd you guys think of this book i liked it it wasn't the most captivating or interesting or even the most like terrifying or like like scary book but it was it was kind of like a a fun read i liked all the characters enough that i stayed invested i was curious to see how it ended i don't think i'd recommend it Mm -hmm. to friends but i don't regret reading it either i'm with you there so when i after i read i'm like this is pure J horror. This is like the definition of a J horror book. Um, I, I, but and it makes sense. This book came out in either early '80s or '90s. We're still up for debate on that. And this, I mean, this might have helped inspired more J horror. But it's the idea that it is psychological. It begins with a slow build up, and then everything goes nuts. Mm-hmm. Like Sade mentioned near the end, and you're just like, "Wow, where did all this?" When did what happened earlier? Why didn't this more ghostly stuff happen earlier? Because for the most part, it was very, very subtle. It's not until like the last fourth where I I would say actual ghostly things happen. Because I mean, the elevator breaks down. That's I mean, it's creepy, but it's not supernatural. Tamao hurts her leg, and they're unsure how that happened. 
but it's it's not exactly as supernatural as you'd think. It's not until I would say Tepe goes down and there's actually a ghost wind that you're like, yep, that's a supernatural thing. That mm-hmm. that's actually supernatural. I would say a lot of the earlier parts of the book is sort of setting up uh, a lot of there's a lot of social commentary in there about. Um, not just his family, but I think about just the life that's being lived through the perspective of these characters. So along with the slow burn that is the gradual buildup of the the ghostly, the spirit presence in the apartment, uh, there is the slow realizations about all the different sort of flaws with this family. Not really to Mal, she's innocent, and actually I feel kind of bad that by the end of the book, presumably she meets the same... Um, mysterious fate as her parents. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of themes about sort of burying the past and trying to move on, but not really reconciling with it. Um, This is encapsulated pretty early on by the talk about Reiko's uh, suicide Mm -hmm. and how Misao and uh, Tepe's affair was what caused it. And yet they're like, well, we talked about it a long time ago and we worked past it and we've moved on and we're just going to, you know, just not worry about it. It's not really our problem. Da, da, da. And they just kind of, you know, they're trying to like not guilt themselves, even though they're kind of very much still living with that. And the people around them definitely still judge them. We know that like Misao's parents have a really strained relationship with her as a result. Her mother basically said, you're evil, you're going to hell. And her father has refused to speak to her for seven years as a result of what happened. Um, on Tepe's end, you've got Tatsuji, who still struggles with calling Misao his you know, sister-in-law, and eventually does come out about saying, like, the way, basically, I liked Reiko, and you treated her like shit, basically. What you did to her was wrong, basically. Yeah. I don't hold against Misao, I'm more angry with you. I find it interesting, because um, it seemed like his brother, it does hint quite a bit that he had a crush on he, uh, Reiko. Yeah, I made that assumption too. I definitely get that feeling. So I think that's kind of why he, probably he might have suffered as well. Or, I mean, he dies. So that's... <laughs> he, well, I, I hate to say this, but he dies because he very much goes the uh, the idiot savant route of like, hey, if we go down this haunted tunnel, we're going to find hell. Mm-hmm. And he just basically kind of loses it, you know, by the end of it. Because he's yeah. so desperate to get out of there. He, he breaks pretty quick. I think Tatsuji was at a bit of a disadvantage in that, like, Tepe kept his cool because he'd already been living with this shit for a while, whereas Tatsuji and Naomi were, like, just suddenly thrown into the, the mix of into all the midst of all this. Mm-hmm. So I feel like he, he had less time to kind of process and, like, collect himself, which is why partly why he, like, reacted so crazy in the basement. Because he was just, like, mm-hmm. desperate, whereas Tepe had kind of come to terms with it gradually already. That's true. He, he was a, he was a tough enough to crack at the beginning, too. So. Yeah, he's a stubborn man. I have to say, I was pretty pleased that Tepe turned out to be a good husband up in, up to the very end. Because mm-hmm. I thought when he was, like, being really stubborn about, like, there's nothing weird about this apartment, y'all are crazy, uh, that he was going to go down that bad route and just, like... I mean, they, they, there are points where, like, they yelled at each other because they were frustrated over their situation, but, like, that shit happens. Yeah. But he, like, immediately, like, still hung over, tries to make amends for that. So I, I liked his character. He was a good guy. He was doing the best that he could. And I like that, that he kept trying his best. It's true. I mean, he, he's clearly trying to make amends, and the guilt is still there for things that happened in the past, but mm-hmm. he's, he's trying. I'll give him that much. Ain't gonna save him, though, from the evil spirits that can sense it. Nope. Unfortunately. Because this whole thing is a big morality play. Well, it's, hey. <laughs> so, interestingly enough, when I was looking up the pronunciations for the different names, I saw that Misao's name, which, not surprising, but it's kind of f- interesting. Her name means chastity or fidelity or virginity, like one of those terms. And I'm like, oh, wow. Mariko Kueki knew exactly what she was doing when she named her Misao. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of it there's there's a big allegory in the whole thing mm-hmm. like usually in, in ghost I feel like in a lot of Japanese ghost stories there is it does tie into a lot of allegory generally usually past sins from someone to come back to bite them uh, from what I've observed and even like other things like in some places I was drawing parallels to as we were, as I was thinking about it to paranoia agent only because it was a situation of guilt that seemed to spark all of this I mean here obviously this is 
something that was festering in the building long before they got there. But the slow buildup of the haunting leads to them eventually being isolated. And while we don't really know what's going on with the others, it's like they're able to get away while they're the ones who are kind of trapped there. Not that the spirits don't try, but the last time they even remotely do anything weird is with the caretakers. Mm-hmm. The Takan... Mm-hmm. The Takan... Takanos? Tabata. The, oh, no. Yeah, the Tabatas. No, the, I, I put t- I put the Kanos and the Tabatas together. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, the Tabatas, the caretakers, when they leave and they... Uh, does it... Knowing what we know now, did they narrowly avoid getting melted? Because, like, a shaft of light shot through their car? Or did the spirits, like, abandon their attack on them? I mean, it could be either or. Where it's like, ah, they're old, let them get away, they're going to join us down in like another month or something. That's <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> but I feel like I maybe read the story a little differently than you, because I don't think it's so much of like trying to bury your your sins in your past, where it was more of a sh- showing disrespect towards the past, to towards the dead. Mm-hmm. Because I do feel like Tepe and, and Misao, yeah, they're the reason Reiko died but they spent years like talking it over and discussing it amongst themselves and kind of coming to terms with it so they themselves are at peace with what more or less at peace uh enough that they are they did make plans to go and visit her grave and pay their respects Mm -hmm. but that was more so for their benefit than to really respect the memory of reiko so i think it's that disrespect also in that instead of honoring that this graveyard couldn't be moved the the city was like ah fuck it let's build the tunnel and that that's disrespectful yeah Yeah. oh that's i mean that's kind of what i was saying i think we're actually on the same page i just think i was saying it as well as i could yeah they it's like they they make a show but it's all perform like these things are are performative gestures Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's for their peace of mind more than anything yes because let's be honest if it really was for the guilt of reiko they would have never married they would have never got back together and continued dating. Yes, they talked about it over and over and made peace with it. But they made peace with themselves. It's with themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If it was out of respect for the dead, they wouldn't have put uh, Reiko's portrait and her little shrine pieces away in the closet. They would have been hung up somewhere. Yeah. I think there is a hint that Reiko's ghost or something like that is a part of it. Because if I recall at the end... The tablet they have, it, it's Reiko's tablet, unwraps itself mm-hmm. by itself. And it's like, oh, that's mm-hmm. eerie. Yeah, uh, and Tepe has that nightmare at one point about Reiko standing by his bed. And he even feels like the sheets there and feels that they feel different when the place mm-hmm. where he remembers her standing and putting her hands on the sheets. Um, how much she's involved is hard to say if she is involved at all. But... Can I throw a theory at you about it? Yeah. Of course. Reiko, when she, when she kills herself, she leaves a note that says, you know what? I'm not angry. You go live your happy life. Um, so I feel like in terms of like her, her spirit was definitely there, but I don't think she was the cause of anything bad or negative happening. I kind of feel like that scene where Tepe wakes up from the nightmare that she had was like saying something in his ear to him. I think I read that as her trying to warn him that shit mm. was about to go oh. down. Yeah, that tracks because P- Pioko was doing the same thing, but yeah. mostly to 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 Mao. Because so. mm-hmm. Pioko love probably loved the little girl. You know, you I bet you anything. If anything had happened to Cookie earlier in the story, Cookie's ghost would have come and gone to Mao and be like, "Bark, bark! Mm. You need to leave." <laughs> Yeah. And well, to be fair, Bark Bark, You Need to Leave happened quite a few times in the book. Mm-hmm. But no one listens to Cookie. Poor Cookie. Yeah, because I think the the memorial tablet, it kind of like unraveling itself from that shroud was maybe like, hey, if you are, if you guys are respectful to the dead, maybe it'll fucking leave you alone. That's kind of like the idea that I got. Mm-hmm. But that is purely my own theory as to like why we saw Reiko visit uh, Tepe in his sleep and like the whole just that's my theory that if they had maybe like just, like hung her tablet up and just like paid respects to her, maybe even gone to the graveyard and paid respects to the spirits there. Be like, hey, we're your neighbors now. Like, was, you know, like maybe they would have turned out differently. Maybe it would have been a happy neighborhood. If I recall, uh, I mean, Misao tries to do a little prayer for Reiko, but then 
Tepe is just like, meh. Because Misao's like, no, we, we should do this. And I, I think he's just over it. He's apathetic about it. Oh, I yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I remember that bit. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's even more disrespectful because, again, that was his wife. Like, he was married to her, so. <laughs> he really took her suicide note to heart, though. Oh, just go live your life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh man, I, I, um, I'm so. This is this is such dark stuff, and we're laughing about it. Well, it's it's just the absurdity of it too. And I, you know, I, I have another theory. There's a lot you can discuss. Are we certain that whatever is beneath, it, you know, whatever is haunting the place, are the spirits of the graveyard? Are they the spirits of the deceased, or are they some other form of evil spirit that has come to live there? Because because keep in mind, we're dealing with. Um, you know, a place where, you know, the idea of Shinto is pretty big and, you know, there's spirits tied to all kinds of things. There's, you know, thousands of spirits associated with different concepts, different objects, different places. Um, for all we know, this thing that is, or these things that are down there might not even be the spirits of the graveyard, but might have risen in conjunction to what happened to the, you know, kind of the desecration and the disrespect of the graveyard. Mm-hmm. We don't know what it is. I mean, I, I, I don't want to use the term demons because it's not demons, not in the classic sense, not in the, not in the sense that like Western audiences would understand demons. I'm talking about like straight up just evil spirits. If it was evil spirits, we're talking about yure. Yes, yure. It could be anything because we don't, one, we're not super familiar with like Japanese, like paranormal, like supernatural folklore. Um, we know a little bit about Yurei because of things like The Grudge, and I've, like, read all upon them before. Or any, like, you know, you read up, um, stuff about, like, Bakemono and yeah. Yurei and any of, like, the mm-hmm. folklore, and you see that, like, they just come in a myriad of forms and have lots of mm-hmm. crazy powers. I mean, it, it's interesting because in, in a lot of Jap, from my, my observation, a lot of Japanese folklore is sort of, like, monsters and ghosts are kind of interchangeable, mm-hmm. you know? They're, like the spirits of the dead can appear as monsters and monsters can appear more ghostly. Like there's it, the line is very blurred. They're all kind of the same. They're not all kind of the same thing, but they're, there's a lot of the classifications are not as distinct. So mm-hmm. it could be a combination of a lot of different things, but trying to define, I love that the book never defines what exactly that thing is or what mm-hmm. those things are that's haunting the, uh, the Phantom Road. It just refers to them as them or they. I really dig that. <laughs> I love that we never see it. Yeah, we never get like a clear description of like what it could be. If I had to like guess on what, what any of it was, my thought is like Yure that are just like angry that like this tunnel was built and like whether it was like filled in or not. Because it, it could be, oh, it was filled in and then this like tunnel... Uh, supernaturally manifested on the other side of this wall that they take mm-hmm. down later or mm-hmm. it could be that they never filled it in and it like this tunnel this road instead of like leading to Taikano station it has like transformed into this like portal into this this underworld yeah <laughs> that's what I thought it was I do want to think that it is ghosts there is this um famous scene in the book where hands appear on the door the glass door and um, leaving sticky white residue. But then one of the hands is missing a finger? And it's never explained what this hand is. Like, there's no hints of, like, another character who has lost a finger or anything like that. It's just this weird thing that pops up in the author notes. It pops up twice, though, because that's a way that... I think it's important that uh, Misao saw the finger the first time when the Inoues are trying to move away. Mm -hmm. And... She sees that same handprint again the, when they're trapped in the apartment and realizes it's the same thing as making the prints. Like the same distinct entities are there barring their escape. Yeah, that's why I think it's ghost or um, the anger of the ghost of uh, the graveyard or definitely a multitude of entities because one of them has a missing finger. I mean, it could be just to note that, no, these are the same spirits. Just letting you know, but like that, I don't think that's necessary. It's. I, I think it's probably to hint at no, these are actual ghosts, but it could be to note that these are the same entities that are coming after you. I, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it. I'm with you though. I'm more inclined to believe that the result of the, these things is because of the connection between the graveyard and the spirit world and the apartment, and they all kind of come together in this perfect storm of evil spirits and angry ghosts. So it could be a lot of different things all coming together to be like. And it, it, there doesn't have to be a reason they're preying on the family, but this particular family, but I think it does tie to the disrespect. 
mm-hmm. and the attempts to try and move on. Because I feel like the bit at the end, when they're trapped in there in the epilogue, and this thing is, has remained downstairs and hasn't tried to come up to them, you know, the thing that was behind the wall, until the moment when Tep- Tepe and Misao decide to make love. And while they're doing that, that's when the elevator comes up. I don't know if that's just for dramatic effect or whatever, but they're trying to have this, they're having this moment, this, this you know, living moment together. And there's a whole thing about we are alive. And I feel like that's what finally draws the entities up to try and finish them off. That's my thought, at least. I don't know why, but in my brain... You're not allowed to be happy. Stop it. <laughs> this sounds awful, but in my brain, I feel like that's kind of a nicer ending of basically these evil things just taking them all at once because i really didn't want to hear about the dog dying from starvation or the child dying from starvation because that's where it was going or Mm -hmm. um he heat exhaustion because like as i was reading i'm like oh my gosh i can't believe they have a dog in this situation and a child yeah that's so sad like that they don't deserve that no. yeah i think amisao even has that thought of like poor cookie like she's stuck in this circumstance because she's with us mm-hmm. like this dog is innocent and and because she's ours she has to suffer with us mm. cookie handles it best though yeah <laughs> i am glad we don't ultimately know their fate we just know that the thing is coming for them And then at the very end of the book, there's an advertisement selling the Central Plaza mansion. Mm -hmm. It's like about a year later. Presumably they're gone. This is, I enjoy, I'm really enjoying discussing this one though. I I, I dig the, like the visuals that are in here. There's all kinds of little subtle things. I like the, the TV going on the fritz whenever the spirit activity becomes higher. Mm -hmm. Um, Things like that. I like the scene where the Tabatas are leaving and the taxi driver mentions that he saw what looked like their relatives standing at the temple bidding them farewell when, you know, they didn't see anybody. And this is after Mm -hmm. the weird light flash. And even I like the subtle things like the weirdness of them being flummoxed every time they try to leave and go somewhere else that seems coincidental, but there's no way it could be with the the house burning down and the young bride-to-be just suddenly keeling over. But like that time when they're like, well, we finally found this new place to live and they're being followed by a black swallowtail. Mm -hmm. (laughs) was there more to be said or do we want to go on to like uh, reader questions we only got one reader question um which was from bringer thank you bringer yes thank you bringer (laughs) a couple of our normal uh listeners said oh i forgot to read this i'm so sorry thank you for for everyone who's who ever has submitted a question or who try to keep up with the books as we go through them we understand that you can't always keep up or you can't always make time to read a book every month but like we love you guys for for just the one question you've ever sent in like just the one like it's great or even just uh suggesting books or whatnot we really do appreciate it it's one of the reasons we keep doing this is because it is supposed to be a book club and that's not just for us but it's also for our listeners so Mm -hmm. your engagement and any engagement you've given us before has been a motivation to keep this uh, show going so thank you uh, we've been discussing he's like what is your guys's theories on why the events are happening to them it seems weird that they are the ones to awaken this thing I, and i guess the way to spin this is is the ghost actually coming after them specifically or is it just because they're the last ones to leave i think it's because they're the last ones because uh they almost stopped the inoue family from leaving and they did kind of start following the tabatas when they left I, I think it just kind of, and I don't think this, like, family is, like, what triggered anything to happen. I don't think anybody who moved into the complex triggered what was happening. It was just an unfortunate and bad luck that they moved in, and even worse, that they were the last ones to move out. Because whatever was there was like, okay, well, as long as we have this one family, we're gonna, like, we're, we'll, we'll do shit to them. Like, if everyone else gets away, fine. But, like, this one family's last, and we're gonna go after them. I'm with you as well. I think it is because they are the last to leave. Mm-hmm. Of course, because it's a book, there's going to be the parallel of their dark secret with Reiko, and what happened with uh, the tunnels underneath. But it's clearly they're anchored and they need to take it out on someone. So they're going to take it out on uh, this family or whoever's in this apartment. Because I think another thing to be said about this book is the idea, or there is a theme of gentrification and how it can be disrespectful 
to the past or to tradition because first of all it's an apartment and it's like this very nice apartment but it's in the middle of a graveyard like it's just there just be like hey come buy stuff consume and it's the 1980s this is um i i, I looked this up because we're at the we're still in the post-war economic miracle right oh yeah because I, I was looking it up and i was trying to make sure because in america that was the case it's the same case in Japan. Yeah. And they're also in the state where, uh, where in Japan, the nuclear family was big, just as it was in 1980s America. So there is the idea of, oh, trying to keep moving ahead, um, keeping ha- uh, having kids, keeping the family life, moving forward, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shiny, happy people holding mm-hmm. hands. Yeah. And then it's the same thing of what causes... Most likely these spirits to get angry is creating a shopping mall, an underground shopping mall underneath <laughs> the graveyard. It's spitting on tradition. There's a Buddhist temple on the site too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, these spirits, they're, they're fucking pissed. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so if there's any reason that they would decide this is the family that we're not going to let leave, it might be because Tepe and Misao were so like... Let's move on. Let's live our life. We're going to, you know, like, live. We're going to we have a happy family. And, like, Mitsue even makes these comments uh, when she's leaving, when one of the Tabatas so or the manager is leaving, that she was envious and kind of wanted to dislike Misao because she had her daughter and a wonderful husband and she's young and she's got her whole life. And she's living her life, you know? Um, and so if the spirits are angry at the living and you have this family... That is just kind of like the embodiment of just like living your life, you know, uh, then that could be a reason why they targeted them more so than the rest. Mm, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. And, you know, they, they got out while the getting was good. Their stubbornness, their unwillingness to leave is ultimately what made them a target. Because if they wanted, they actually wanted to respect them, they would have taken the warning signs that they kept getting early and skedaddled, which everybody else did. Oh, yeah. Like there were so many families already moving out, like even way before they were. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they're like, huh, there's, it must say something if half of the families have moved out within the past month. I mean, the activity just kept growing and growing and growing until whatever was there. I'm not even sure the same things were necessarily trying to warn them. It was more like they were trying to, they, they were still mustering their power. They, whatever was in there was waking up. Mm-hmm. It was kind of, it was definitely growing over time. And I think definitely one of the tipping points was when they saw like that chink in the hole, the little hole in the wall Mm -hmm. where it was just like two inches and it was like, it's, it's forcing its way through. It's like making its way through. And then Tatsuji just busted open even more Yep. and it just kind of, it opened things up to make things even worse because it, it, they let it out. The, the moment that they described it moving in the tunnel, I could just picture was, uh, no face from, uh, Spirited Away just going, om nom nom. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Gobbling them up. Yeah. Goodbye, Naomi and your shoulder pads. Goodbye, (laughs) Tatsuji. Oh my god. Um, yeah, I'm kind of with you. Like, I could, there's part of me that doesn't want to entirely let go of the idea, but I think it is more circumstantial. Like, I think the thing with Reiko really kind of set them up to have that stubborn attitude of we are going to live the best life possible, no matter what supernatural, you know, suppose we, we won't let superstition and super, and the past and supernatural forces keep us from living the life we want mm-hmm. but until it becomes their, like, absolutely their detriment to do so. And by then, by the time they try to change things, it's too late. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, we've already talked about that at length, but hopefully that answers that question from Bringer. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, his next question is, what happened to the people that got zapped? And why did the building do, not do the same to the elderly supers leaving as, as well? Also, what's with the family the taxi driver saw? I'm thinking that's the only time we ever see a manifestation of anything that might be there. Mm -hmm. You can't say necessarily what the taxi driver saw exactly because he's just looking at them casually through his like window or whatever, but Mm -hmm. a bunch of shadowy figures. It sounded like the taxi driver just saw a crowd of people that he assumed were the family of the the old couple as they were leaving Mm -hmm. because i think if they if they looked off or if they were just shadowy figures and i think he probably would have noted that Mm. so we know that there is 
multiple entities that are causing those handprints and those handprints are described as some being muscular, some being thin, some being feminine, some being small child size hands. When missing a finger. So what the taxi driver saw was the entities. That's what that was. It was just them being like, hmm. I think they were just like standing there and being like, should we let them go? Or do we like zap them now? And I think, I don't, that's just how it felt to me. But like, I think they did try to. They might have and then it didn't work. And they're just like, I guess we let these ones go. We don't have full zapping power yet. I also think that they wanted to keep their focus on keeping the last family there. And whereas uh, the air condition guy and the electrician and the moving people, they were a threat to opening the door and letting them go free. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they got zapped where the other family is like, we just want to leave. Bye. And they probably wanted to stop them. But it's like, no, we have to focus more on keeping this family there. I do feel like they tried because they couldn't open the door. It could also just be that these these spirits collectively did not have enough power yet. Like they tried to zap and it was just like, just not enough yet. Mm -hmm. That's why I also think these are ghosts because of the fact he said, oh, like those people waving you off. And they're like, what, what people, what family? There's no one waving us off. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it is the ghost of the people in the graveyard. Well, down the tunnel, they did describe hearing a bunch of human voices talking mm-hmm. to, but, you know, it could be anything making those sounds. Bringer's theory, actually, he, um, he gave a theory, is that the building is the hole made by the spirit's awakening and that they formed into one hive mind of emotion that then uh, triggered um, something in them to become bloodthirsty. I could see it as them kind of coming together as one collective force, you know, especially if they're moving up and down the Phantom Road. That makes sense, yeah. He he said, I very much like that they never reveal the monster at the end of the book. Um, It really got me. I would love for this to be made into a movie. Oh, well, hey. (laughs) (laughs) So you're in luck, Bringer. Um, It actually is being made into a movie. I forget who's directing it, but it is uh, gon- it is going to be uh, a movie made in Japan, and it's supposed to come out. Uh, I do believe it's going to be the same director who did The Grudge. <gasps> That's right, Ju-on, the Juwan movie, mm-hmm. but it's being made for the U.S. like Western audiences. Because I know that they when they changed the Wai- Misao's name to something like Mizuki or something like that, if I remember, the, they have a son named Shiro instead, and I think the husband is white because he had an American name. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm like, yay, but also like, eh. eh. Um, but I'm excited either way. I think it'll be fun. I think we'll, the three of us will watch it when it does come out. <laughs> I want to see it. I, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind, uh, maybe we could bring it up in another discussion, but, um, until then, we'll just wait and see when it comes out. It, it does say it's according to IMDb, but. Yeah, I think it's IMDb, when I checked it, it said it's in pre-production right now, and it comes out next year? Yeah, it's saying that it's going to be filmed in both Los Angeles and Tokyo, so we'll see what happens there, Mm. so. Please don't put the graveyard apartment in America. Can it, it needs to be in Tokyo in the in the eighties like that. Uh. <laughs> huh. It'll be interesting to see. Well, I want to ask you guys then, as I have my own question. Like, what scene do you want them to keep in the movie that you would like to see translated into film? Oh, I really do want the um, handprints on the glass. That's for sure. And I am curious to see how the wind would appear in the basement when Tepe goes down. I want to see the people getting zapped. <laughs> I, I'm curious how that's going to happen. Like, how does how do they zap them? Like, I feel like if they're going to change anything, they're probably going to change that. But I want to see it. <laughs> I already thought these forces were pretty strong. Because, I mean, their house, the house they wanted to move into, suddenly burns down. And then there's another apartment they were going to move into, and the woman suddenly dies. It's like, how far is their reach? Jeez. Yeah, uh, that's all the questions that I have. Do we have any final thoughts? It was a fun read. It's not my favorite thing that we've read this year, but... I had a good time. Yeah, I don't regret reading this. I think this book was very interesting. I I stayed engaged for the most part. 
I think most readers might get bored by the beginning because it is a slow build. It mm. is a lot of description about the family and their day-to-day -day lives and all that. And I can see people getting bored and being like, when are we going to get to the supernatural stuff? And that doesn't really happen until later. Yes, there's a couple hints here and there. Mm -hmm. I think you definitely have to either like Jehara on some level to kind of enjoy uh, this because I, well, I do appreciate Jehara because it does usually take its time in setting things up. And so, yeah, the first part, first good half of the book is, is kind of slow and then not too much is happening. But I appreciate that it will, Jehara will usually take as much time as it damn well pleases to set things up and to build up that anticipation. Mm -hmm. Is it everyone's cup of tea? No, but is it not always my cup of tea either? But I, I appreciate that it will do that, that it will take its time setting that up. Me too. And actually, when you ask me what I hope they keep, I actually hope they keep that pacing. I would like the movie to be a slow burn as well. I'd like to have long, ominous shots of things. I would like there to be anticipation of stuff. And I, I like the idea that it does, it would take its time and not rush Hollywood style. Well, bam, well, bam, well, bam, well, bam throughout the whole thing. I want this to be paced very deliberately you know what i mean mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's that's i don't have there's not a specific scene of, apart from the ones that you described i do want to see those happen my hope is that what we don't see and i hope we never actually see the entity i hope we never see what's actually haunting them but Same. just with vague hints maybe at most whatever appears is just manifestations like the hands on the glass or... yeah yeah exactly Agreed. In that case, uh, <laughs> we shall close this book and uh, discuss our next book we're going to read. Actually, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who voted on the Twitter poll as well as our uh, Patreons on the Discord channel. Thank you for sending in your votes. Uh, we decided that we are going to read a Fear Street book by R.L. Stein because we learned there's going to be a Fear Street trilogy coming out on Netflix in July. And I don't think any of us has really read a Fear Street book or... <laughs> yep. I read a Ghosts of Fear Street book a while ago, but that's it. Yeah, I think I... Same. Like, I think I read a Ghost of Fear Street book as well, but I can't remember it for the life of me. So it would be nice to get a feel of what kind of horror Fear Street gives compared to maybe Goosebumps. So um, thank you guys for voting. The winner for uh, the book we will be reading is The First Evil, which is actually a part of the cheerleader trilogy. I guess we're going to be reading about evil cheerleaders, but we're only reading the first book. We'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I was able to find it on the Libby app, so <laughs> I can easily borrow it. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to some good old R.L. Stein schlock. Yeah, it's, it's going to be nice to go from this, like, I don't want to say the story was completely tragic, but the ending is so... It's heavy. Heavy that it, it is kind of nice to move to um, schlocky teen horror. <laughs> <laughs> From what I've heard, the Netflix series, actually, the films are rated R, if I recall. Oh, are they? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Like, they're actually going to be rated R films. Huh. So... I'm curious to see how that's going to go, but thanks for listening. Uh, if you would like to um, make any suggestions for what books we should read next, or if you're interested in wanting to ask questions about the book or just interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter at darklylitpod or email us at um, darklylit at gmail.com. Feel free to check out the other uh, podcasts on the Creative Horror Network at creativehorror.com. There you can listen to some of our other programs like um, Undercooked Analysis and Midnight Marinara, as well as old episodes of The Witching Hour and Trick or Track. Also, we have a cryptid writing contest going on right now. Uh, we're still taking submissions. Um, we will be taking those until July 4th. If you want to learn more about it, again, check them out on creativehorror.com. The rules are listed there. And happy Pride Month! Happy Pride Month, everybody! Happy Pride Month! Just letting you know, Creative Horror is a queer-friendly uh, network. I mean, most of the people who work on this are uh, part of the LGBTQ community in some way or another, so... We're not fake corporate queer. We're... <laughs> <laughs> for real queer. <laughs> We're legit queer. <laughs>
<laughs> but we could be gayer. Could always be gayer. We could be gayer. <laughs> we- I feel like I'm holding you back from being as gay as you could be. Being <laughs> And I'm sorry. I'll step away if you want to be like the most gay you can be. Oh no, don't worry. Um, we plan to read a gay horror novel at some point. I know Saw Kill Girls is definitely on our list. I've been wanting to hit that one for a while. We'll get to that someday. I know we will. Mm-hmm. Until then, uh, let us not go into the basement. And uh, but it's so spacious down there. Huh? <sighs> so cold. Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at CreativeHorror.com. <laughs>